And I also think we need to look more at success, other people's success and competition as a really positive thing. If somebody else is achieving success in an area that you want to achieve success, that means it's possible. That means there's a market for it. That means, I don't know, maybe if you opened your eyes to it, you could actually learn something from what they're doing. Let's be honest, y'all. There is a lot of bad advice out there. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another healthy business episode. These are my more slowed down, chilled out, laid back podcast episodes. So if you didn't know, this is a podcast. I sometimes get comments off if you're watching on YouTube that are like, oh my gosh, get to the point. It's a podcast. So the point is that we hang out, we talk, we have a you know, conversation, you know? So if that's not your thing, just click out. Also, if you didn't know, if you're on YouTube, you can speed me up. You can just go in the little gear icon and, and, and speed up the sound if that's kind of your thing. And of course, my friend, the sun is coming out to mess up the video. We're gonna just keep it moving. We're gonna keep it moving. I wanna talk about some of my unpopular opinions about online business, AKA kind of like my rebuttal to some of the bad advice that I've seen. Now, I am not all knowing. I do not know everything. These are just my opinions, but I'm very against absolutes for a lot of things, but particularly business and online business. I really don't like the whole wake up at 5 a.m. or you'll be a loser forever or these particular strategies that are rewritten as rules, like just because a certain Instagram strategy or, or marketing strategy worked for you doesn't mean that that is the only way. I'm very against that. I always say, you know, you are your business's best superpower. We have things innately in us that make us particularly suited for our businesses. And, you know, it just doesn't make sense that every strategy is going to be a rule for everybody. You know, so my first unpopular opinion about online business is that it's not going to solve all of your problems. Number one, we go into business for a lot of different reasons. Some of us go into business out of necessity. Some of us just have to make money. We got let go of our jobs or we're stay at home moms or, you know, military wives or something like that. Or we're a teacher who is looking to make some extra money over the summer, like whatever the case is. Some of us do that. Right. But I think a lot of people choose entrepreneurship as an alternative alternative to something else, you know, as an alternative to corporate, as an alternative to retail, as an alternative to whatever it is that you are currently doing. And, you know, that's definitely the approach that I took to it. I was working full-time corporate. I worked in corporate for many years. I have a long job history. You know, I worked in retail, I worked in restaurants, and then I worked in the nonprofit sector, and then I worked in corporate marketing. So I've had a lot of different experiences. I've had a lot of different jobs. I had a lot of success at those jobs. I was very good at those jobs, but entrepreneurship called me for a lot of reasons. Definitely the flexibility. I had a lot of moments of, you know, if only I had a flexible job, I could see my family more. If only I had a flexible job. And if I do choose to have children, that would be so much easier, right? I wouldn't have to be stressed out dealing with other people's drama and other people's bureaucracy and all of that, right? And like, of course, some of that is true. I, I think it's undeniable that working for yourself has a level of flexibility that not a lot of other jobs offer. But it also doesn't mean that I'm just free to hang out all day. I wish that was the case. My schedule next week, the reason I'm batch recording today, I'm sure you've seen this outfit already, is because next week I am booked and busy. And this is in a different season of my business than when I was so busy in the agency, right? I'm actually teaching courses. That's my primary initiative right now. And so even with that, I'm still really busy. So while I'm not answering to agency clients or one-on-one -on -one coaching clients anymore, I am teaching a course. I do have to keep that course updated. I do have to show up to the course. I do have to do all of the prep work that's involved in the course. And, you know, I don't need to ramble on about all the things that come along with it, but every, most all types of online business do require you to still answer to someone in some way. Otherwise, what are you selling? Like, are you selling like air that just requires no maintenance and no customer service and no education and no nothing? It's not going to fix all of your problems in terms of giving you all this time and all that stuff. But I also think there's internal problems 
that we often don't think about. I think there's a lot of things about corporate America that are not necessarily fair, right? We can look at the numbers and see how many people who look like me are in executive leadership positions. They're not a lot. It's getting better, but it's not a lot. So we can definitely detect some inequity there, right? But being an online entrepreneur, unfortunately, doesn't safeguard you against that either. It doesn't mean that just because you go into entrepreneurship, you will never experience discrimination again, that you will rise to the top. It doesn't fix all the problems that still exist in the world. And it also doesn't fix your own internal problems either. I was so anxious when I worked in corporate that I was getting sick like once a week, like physically ill. I was scared for myself, to be honest. I was like making appointments with neurologists. It was intense. And that has eased up a little bit, just being able to work on my own schedule and things like that. But I still have bouts of anxiety. Um, I still have days where I physically can't eat or where I'm physically in this anxiety induced migraine that I can't get out of. Like those things still happen. So you still have to do internal work on yourself because they're still going to exist in business. It's not an answer to everything. It's not a cure-all and money isn't either, but we can go into that in another, at another time, but it all ties in, right? Money isn't going to fix your problems either. On a little lighter note, my second unpopular opinion is that you do need a website. I've seen a lot of advice out there, like just start, just start, you know, in, you do have an Instagram, that's all you need, or get a PayPal checkout page. And listen, that's true. And if you are in a moment of, I just got let go of my job, or I have this really cool idea, this is just kind of a side hustle, I just wanna get it out there into the world. Yes, of course, you can do a workaround, you can get a link tree, you can get some way to sell your products. Thrive Cart, I think is another one. You can totally do that, but if you are looking to be an online entrepreneur, if you're looking to become a brand, you know, position yourself as a brand and really you're in this for the long haul, I really do think a website is like something you need at a minimum. I feel like we sometimes overcomplicate online marketing in our heads. And I'm always like, just think about how you respond to things that you buy. How do you purchase? What are your purchasing behaviors? And of course, we might not all be in each other's target audiences and things like that, but you can still visualize it a little bit. I mean, if I hear of a brand, Hey, did you check out these shoes? Like this new brand of shoes or whatever? What am I going to do? I'm going to go onto Google. I'm going to look for their website. If they don't have one, it might be weird. Now I might go on Instagram. I might see if they have a Facebook page or a Twitter, but especially if it involves a larger amount of money, if I'm going to pay $500 for a coaching package or you know, $1,500 for an agency retainer or basically anything, you know, $1,000 for a pair of expensive shoes. I want them to have a website. It's really important. Not only is it important from a social proof perspective and a reputation management kind of perspective, it's also important for analytics. And this is just something in general that I feel like not enough online coaches, educators talk about is like, having measurable data for your business. They say it with me, you guys are gonna get tired of it. Data is how you make decisions. Data is how you make decisions. It's not about like, oh, I think this is pretty or this Instagram photo got a lot of likes. It's, hey, this platform is referring a lot of traffic over to what we're trying to sell. Not only is it referring a lot of traffic, but it's getting people to stick around for a a long period of time. They are purchasing, you know, they're not bouncing away from the page. Like that's how you make decisions. So I don't know that Instagram insights or I I don't know anything about like Thrive Carter or anything. So maybe they do have analytics, but nothing really beats the data that I'm able to get from Google Analytics and from Squarespace to really show me who my audience is and what their behaviors are so I can replicate that and improve. This is a spicy one. Oh my gosh, the next two are actually quite spicy. So let me get a little more comfy. Hustle culture. I feel like this is a bigger, maybe we need to do like a part two on this. Let me know if that's something you would be interested in because I feel like I have a lot to say about this. I've watched a lot of those I don't dream of labor videos. I've seen a lot of criticisms on hustle culture and I have a lot of criticisms on hustle culture. Life is not just about work. No, it is absolutely not. And the older I get and the more successful my business gets, the more I realize that I feel like I'm reaching a level of like enlightenment where I'm like, okay, I need to have a hobby now, you know, but 
I also think that we can skew a little too far on the other side of things sometimes. There is this antithesis of hustle culture, passive income fast four hour work week culture, which I just think is a little unrealistic and or sometimes has some integrity issues. I did a whole video all about the online coaching industry and kind of like ranted and rambled about my thoughts on that. And, you know, I think that there are like two sides of it, right? There are the people who are like, you have to work every day and every night and never take a weekend off and grind and hustle and hustle and hustle. And then there are people who are like, oh yeah, just like write an ebook in Canva in five minutes, sell it for a hundred dollars, make a bunch of promises that you can't keep up with, be new in your own business and have never actually done the thing that you say you can help people do through this ebook and sit back and relax. And I don't think that that is realistic or ethical either. So I think there's a balance and I think it's important to know seasons and I think it's important to know your limits and also have goals that you're striving for. I'm really sorry about the sun. Like it's like, I don't know what the heck it's doing. I guess clouds, I guess that's how clouds work. Yes. My entrepreneurship story is that I hustled for years, uh, but not too many years. I hustled for a couple years when I was in my early 20s and I had the energy. I didn't have a husband, children. I was in that period of life where I had all the energy to do it. I didn't really have anything else that needed my time besides my nine to five job. I could go really hard with my business, go really hard with my nine to five career as well so that I was getting promotions. I was learning a lot in that nine to five, which I could then take back to my business and then make money from the business, save the money from the business to where I got to the point where I could finally leave my day job comfortably in a smart, comfortable, safe way where I wasn't just taking a risk and had no money in the bank. You know, that was my story. Not every entrepreneurship story is going to look the same. That's the whole point of this episode. There's a lot of different paths and methods to success. I certainly know people who just jumped, you know, they were like, I'm just going to see what happens. But even in that, I would imagine they had to hustle to make it work. Like if you're just leaving your day job with no safety net, I would imagine you probably have to hustle even harder than I did. You know, there's a season of hustle. I really think most, 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 maybe not all. I know some people get lucky. Some people are maybe smarter than me, whatever you want to say. But I think most of us have a season where we do have to work a little bit longer, do two jobs, you know, work on your day job and work on your side job, work on a weekend once in a while. I think that's just setting realistic expectations and entrepreneurship isn't for everybody. And I don't say that because I think I'm better than non-entrepreneurs. In fact, in a lot of ways, I really am jealous of non-entrepreneurs. I sometimes wonder like, what if I took that path? I, I don't want to say it's easier working a nine to five job because we know there's headaches involved in that, which is why I left, but it seems simpler. It seems safer, right? Having a 401k, an employer sponsored 401k sounds pretty cool. Having paid time off sounds pretty cool, you know? So I, it's not that I think anyone is better or worse, but some people are not made the same way. And even in that, not all entrepreneurs are striving for the same thing and are made up of that same entrepreneurial DNA. Me and Gary Vee are very different entrepreneurs, okay? Me and Rihanna are not made up of the same entrepreneurial DNA, you know? Like we have different things that we're, we're striving for. And with that, I guess to like counter what I just said about hustle culture, to be honest, I think it's important to know your own goals because if you hate hustle, if you do not like hustle, you do not like noise, you do not like being busy, you do not like all-nighters, you want to spend time with your kids, that is your sole motivation of being an entrepreneur and a freelancer, then be realistic and say, like, I just need to match my day job income. Maybe that's $30,000, $40,000, whatever it is. Maybe it's less and that's okay. Like, don't let people who are striving for six, seven figures in their businesses influence you too much. You know, I think it's important to know your lane and know what you're, what you're striving for. And again, there is absolutely nothing wrong with wanting to just simply care for your child with your freelance income. There is nothing wrong with that. I certainly am somebody who is always looking to push myself and I'm competitive with myself. So that's probably not for me. And that's probably why I don't 
I'm not completely anti-hustle culture, but for some people that is completely their lane and I absolutely respect that. The next one, like I said, is also a little bit spicy. Uh, let me just put the tweet up on the screen that I posted on Twitter. It was kind of a hot take. It got some hot responses. I have an unpopular opinion. Why are we obsessed with saying other people's social media is a highlight reel and that they could be, quote, miserable in real life? People are allowed to be happy. I think a more important message is that others' happiness shouldn't dull your shine. And I stand by that. And to extrapolate a little bit, what I meant by this is I see all the time people trying to be motivational on Instagram or YouTube or podcasts or whatever. And they're like, you know, that person who you're looking up to, they could be miserable. Their husband could be cheating on them. They could be struggling with infertility. They could be in credit card debt. And I'm like, why? First of all, why do we have to go to like the worst things ever? Like, why couldn't they just have bad days too? Like, why does it have to be that they're like experiencing this massive amount of grief or pain in their lives? It's kind of weird to like be happy about that personally. Like I want most people to be happy. So I find that toxic, but I also have seen people say like, you know, if, if it bothers you that much, or if you are struggling with people's highlight reels on social media, just block them, mute them, just delete them, just unfollow them. And of course, protect your peace. I unfollow people. Like I try to keep a curated following list so I can pay attention to people I actually want to talk to. And that's doesn't mean that because I unfollowed someone, I don't like them. I just, maybe they're not a close friend or somebody who I want to have a relationship with. But I do think it's kind of toxic if you're saying like, just seeing somebody post something happy somehow takes something away from me. I follow people that I like (laughs) and I want them to be happy. And also saying that if they post something happy, it means it's fake. And they're only doing this because it's Instagram and it's, you know, social media and they're showing, they're trying to do this for show. Listen, I'm not a perfect person. As I've said a million times, I am far from perfect, but I try to keep it pretty real on social media. I mean, no, do I post a picture of myself on Instagram when I'm like hunched over and having, you know, a bloated day and have acne and like whatever, No, but like, duh, like who does? Not many of us want to do that, but I do vlog in that way. I vlog in t-shirts and my hair all crazy and I feel I keep it pretty real. I'm honest with you all when I'm going through something and I'm struggling emotionally. I'm honest with you when I'm having a high, you know, an emotional high, a career high. I feel like the whole, they're doing it just to look cool and this is a highlight reel. I feel like it's a little exaggerated. Of course, there are people who are all about the clout, like they wear their Gucci belt for the photos and, you know, it's borrowed and it's fake and all this stuff. Of course, there are those people. But I think in general, people post what they want to post. They post happy things when they're happy and they might post a not so happy Instagram story or YouTube video when they're not that happy. And I think it's kind of weird to project and to assume that it's for show. And I also think it's a little bit unhealthy to be so bothered and envious of somebody that you have to mute, delete. If you're following them, you should like them. I mean, you can choose how you want to follow people, but that's how I follow people. I follow people that I want to actually have a relationship with. I follow some celebrities, but not a ton. You know, it's mostly like people that like I talk to on the internet and if they are experiencing a a really good thing, I'm happy for them. And I think there's a lot of power in that. I think we put too much power in negativity. I've done a whole episode on jealousy and envy. Of course it touches me. Of course I feel it sometimes, but I think it's a lot more powerful if you can say, wow, that person is achieving success. That's really awesome. And I also think we need to look more at success, other people's success and competition as a really positive thing. If somebody else is achieving success in an area that you want to achieve success, that means it's possible. That means there's a market for it. That means, I don't know, maybe if you opened your eyes to it, you could actually learn something from what they're doing. My last tip is one that I already talked about, and that's that there's not just one way to entrepreneurship. I feel like this is dying down a little bit, or maybe I just like did tune it out a little bit, but I feel like maybe a couple years ago, every coach was like the blah, blah, blah method, the Latasha James method. You know what I mean? And I'm so glad I never fell into that trend personally, because it's not that there's anything bad about having a signature method, but I think that the trick then is that 
you need to make sure that who you're coaching actually is a good fit for that method. And understanding that like the Latasha James method is not going to work for everybody. I say it all the time. Like what works for me is batch filming. When you guys ask me, I want to create content. What works for you? I'm like, I sit there and I film for eight hours a day. A lot of you hate that. (laughs) A lot of you are like, I cannot do that. And I respect that. So find the way that works for you. I'm not going to push people into my way. I understand my way works for me, but we all have different lives. We all have different lifestyles. We all have different, we all have different goals, financial, personal, otherwise. Why would I try to push something on somebody else? And also when we talk about money, everybody has a different meaning of success. I already alluded to that a little bit earlier, but I absolutely do not look down on people who are making a fraction of what I'm making and I don't look down or up. I look up to people, of course, but I don't look up to somebody simply because they're making 10 times the revenue that I'm making because there are so many factors to that. One, I'm really happy and really comfortable with what I have now. Two, I don't know how many people are on their payroll. Three, I I don't know that I even want to handle that much money. To be honest, it scares me a little, you know? So we all have a different way in this journey and it's important to just know our superpowers. I did a episode about that. I'll link it. Do our thing and stay in our lane. Those are my unpopular opinions. Go ahead and flame me in the comments. And if you are looking to meet entrepreneurs, get mentorship from other entrepreneurs, as well as myself, the Freelance Friday Club is the best place to do that. It is my just a dream community. I really enjoy being in that community and leading that community. I'm going to leave a 50% off link down in the show notes. If you want to check it out and get started, it is a month to month membership. You can cancel anytime. And we're actually going to get started on a challenge next month that I'm very, very excited about. We're going to be doing some video challenges to really get ourselves out there and get uncomfortable, spread our message and cheer each other on. So it's going to be a lot of fun. You can check that out. Like I said, down in the show notes. Today's question, um, I'm going to go through this quickly. What steps did you take to start scaling your business? Really where I started was identifying my weaknesses and hiring for those weaknesses. So I just write out a simple list of things that I really like to do and that I really want to keep as close to me as possible, things that I don't like to do and that I like actually hate doing. And then things that maybe I want to do, but don't have time to do or don't have the energy to do or whatever. And then I look at what's working in the business and say, okay, YouTube videos drive a lot of traffic to our courses. So let's make more YouTube videos. Let's figure out how to do that. What's preventing me from doing that? Editing. Okay, boom. We'll hire an editor for the podcast. I need to update these courses. I need to get a grip on the customer service for these courses. I don't have time to do that. And I also don't particularly like doing that. Boom. We'll hire an ops manager to really lead that. So that's kind of where I started as I just like started filling in gaps. I think it's important when you're scaling and if you're and if by scaling, you mean like hiring that you're hiring people who kind of pay for themselves, right? I knew that by hiring an ops manager, I was going to be able to put out more courses to have bigger class sizes in my courses and that that would pay for her salary essentially. Like she would, you know, that position would pay for itself. I wasn't hiring something that wasn't going to have a return at least in the next three months, you know, and same thing for video editing. That service should in theory pay for itself because I'm able to produce more content, which is should in theory get me more clicks to my courses and things like that. So that's where I would start. All right. I hope this episode was interesting. I know it's a little fiery. Let me know some of your hot takes or unpopular opinions about online business. I would love, love, love to read them. And I appreciate you as always for listening and tuning in. I will talk to you on next week's episode. Bye.